I'm Betty Duke. I'm the Norman and Florence Brody Forum Professor here at the School of Public Policy. And this is our first Brody Forum of 22. So we're happy to have you join us. Just a little background. Florence Brody was an alumna of the university and her husband, Norman, said he was an alum by marriage. And they believed in the power of education to change the world. And because of that, they endowed this policy forum here at the school to encourage in-depth discussion of important issues. And that work today is carried on by their son, Bill, and his wife, Susan, and stepdaughter, Deirdre, and by his sister and her partner, Sherry and Bonnie Bardner. Over the decades, the Brody speakers have been from the media, from journalism, from academe. They're thought leaders from across the spectrum. My pleasure today is to introduce our Dean and our guest speaker. Uh, first, I'll introduce our Dean, who's been with the School of Public Policy now for seven years. And as that Dean, he has seen the expansion of our school uh, from an, a graduate program to undergraduate, uh, PhD program, and an executive program as well. Prior to um, coming to us, he was the deputy, the assistant secretary general for strategic planning at the UN for 10 years. Prior to that, he was with the Belfer uh, School at uh, Harvard, and he's had several leading jobs in uh, public service in the United States. Our guest today is Chris Omara Vignareja, and she is the president and CEO of the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. And as you can see, this is an issue that is right front and center across the world. So it's an extremely timely opportunity for Chris to be with us. We're very lucky to have her. Just a little background. Um, she was the policy director for uh, Michelle Obama. And um, she led an initiative, for example, Let Girls Learn which is of course near and dear to my heart, which is it talks about empowering women and girls through education. Prior to that, she served as an advisor to secretaries of state Curry and Clinton. She came to the US when she was a baby and her parents brought her here with no jobs and 200 bucks in their pockets. She grew up in Baltimore, attended Yale, has degrees in political science and molecular, cellular and developmental biology. She graduated magna cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa. She was a Marshall Scholar at Oxford and earned an MPhil there in international relations, and then a law degree at Yale where she was on the Law Journal. She currently serves on the Bars Commission on Immigration. She's worked at prominent law firms, taught at Georgetown, another thing we share in common. And she is listed today as one of the top 100 women in the country. She's married and has a daughter. So you can see her plate is really full. So we are, are so lucky to have with her with us today. And we're very grateful that she accepted our invitation. Just a few rules of the road. Um, Chris and Bob will have some time for a dialogue. And then um, they'll turn it over to Patrick as we like to say the Brody Forum belongs to our students. And so Patrick Kelly is our Brody scholar who heads the Brody student board. And Patrick will lead the student questioning, uh, ably assisted by members of the board. So we want your questions. So please feel free to put them in the chat and our, our good Miranda, uh, part of our board will be passing them to Patrick as, as they come in. Please be part of the discussion. So now it is my pleasure to welcome a true practitioner scholar. We're so happy to have you and our moderator, our own Dean Bob Orr. Thank you, Bob and Krish, it is all yours. Thank you so much, Betty. And uh, thank you to the entire uh, Brody uh, family and the students who have helped uh, select this programming today. Uh, the Brody program allows us to explore the big issues to the, of the day with leaders who are blazing trails on those big issues. 
And it's uh, with that in mind that I am so pleased to welcome Krishomara Vignaraja to uh, join us today. Um, I will engage with Krish in a little conversation, but the real conversation I think will be between our students and our guest. Um, the context for this discussion is uh, that we are uh, about to head into our 40th anniversary as a school. Um, we've been doing a deep dive into not just 40 years of history, but where the field of public policy has been and where it is going and where we're going to be going in the next 40 years. So, Chris, I'll give you a, a fair warning that part of my questions will have an ulterior motive is to draw you out and your vision of what the field of public policy should look like and what the training of public policy leaders should look like over the next 40 years. So if you don't mind, I'll just put my, uh, my agenda up here on the wall and uh, uh, hope that we can get some of your wisdom for our, uh, our active celebration of our 40th anniversary. Um, it is so nice to welcome you. Um, I thought maybe the, the best way would be to just dive in with a, a couple uh, questions. I know you are uh, absolutely no stranger to uh, not just journalist interviews, but the academic uh, world. I wanted to um, uh, start with the intersection of your personal story and uh, the policy world of immigration and uh, refugees. Um, I came to work in public policy because of my work with refugees in Southern California decades ago. So I, I know the importance of, of this field in drawing me, but uh, I am curious if you find any persistent discrepancies between perceptions and realities of who are the immigrants and the refugees and why are they here? Um, uh, it is something that has uh, been of interest to me for many years. And I think having lived and worked in this space from a policy practitioner point of view, I'd like to hear a little bit from you to start maybe about the differences between the policy or the perceptions and the realities in this area. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dean Orr, and it is really such a pleasure to be with all of you here um, today. It's exciting that this is your first um, of the 2022 series. Um, hope one day to be in person, uh, especially since you're not very far um, from me uh, here in Montgomery County. Um, it is a great question because I do think that one of the biggest challenges that we face, and frankly, one of the areas that I've been focused on since I started at LIRS in 2019 is the difference between sort of perception and reality. And I think that there are <clears throat> probably um, uh, three or four, you know, th there's a lot of misperception in this field. Um, and you obviously know it having worked in this space, um, really wonderful to hear that context. But I think that part of what we see today um, is negative narratives that are frankly baseless. Um, and in fact, uh, the truth couldn't be farther from what we hear. So a good example is, um, you know, you hear about the Southern border. It's been in the news in the last week because President Biden and the administration announced that in a couple months, Title 42, which was a purported public health rule, um, will, will ultimately uh, be, be lifted. And if you hear the you know, narrative when you turn on the TV or pick up a newspaper, it's this idea of immigrants who are criminals and rapists who are coming over to the US to kind of you know, plunder and rob and, 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 and hurt Americans. And you know, when you look at the data, it couldn't be farther from the truth. So for example, there was a study that looked at the 21 border counties um, along our southern border. And uh, they are actually safer than comparable counties in the interior. Uh, if you look at refugee resettlement, there was a longitudinal study that was done that looked at the top 10 cities that had received the highest number of refugees per capita. And what it showed was that in nine out of 10, 
crime went down significantly. Violent crime, commercial crime, you name it, it went down. The one exception was West Springfield, Massachusetts, and it was because they were experiencing an opioid epidemic. And so that's why I think it's really important when you hear, you know, this constant questioning about vetting and how are Afghans, you know, going through the procedure and how do we avoid terrorists coming into the country? To be clear, we as an immigration organization obviously believe in a secure border. We believe that there need to be vetting protocols in place. But we can do that and have a humane policy that protects people's legal rights. Um, another misperception is that immigrants are coming here to take Americans' jobs. Obviously, at a time when there are you know, roughly 14 million jobs that are going unfilled, we as an organization, and I hate to kind of say I told you so, but we had always said that immigrants in general are taking jobs that would otherwise go unfilled. And so when we see this today, jobs that are going unfilled because we have been so exclusive, it is borne out what we have kind of in general said. And I think just the final point I will make is the, the general perception that is so problematic is really this otherness, right? Somehow, even though the vast majority of us trace our lineage back to some place beyond our borders, right? When you see, um, you know, obviously you mentioned, Dean, um, my personal story of coming here when I was nine months old, Professor Duke kind of referenced that as well. The O'Mara part of my name is for my husband, Colin Patrick O'Mara, and obviously his name gives away his, his roots. So he had Irish ancestors who fled after the potato famine and came to the US. Unless you are part of the indigenous community, or you were forced here through slavery, uh, slavery, someone in your family was forced here through slavery. Otherwise, someone in your lineage, someone in your ancestry made a decision to come to the US and thank God for that. And so I think that's where it's really important for us to understand the truth, which is they are us. I, I love just the, the clarity of your vision, but the they is us, it couldn't be more central to defining who we are as a country. Um, you have worked these issues from within the government and now as the CEO of an important uh, non-governmental organization. We have students that uh, pursue uh, public service and policy careers in government, in the nonprofit sector, in, in the uh, academic or, or knowledge sectors. Um, can you say a little bit about what you have found particularly fulfilling about the government role and the, the advocate or nonprofit roles? Um, I, I think here on an issue like immigration and or refugees, the needs are so um, so gripping, so they're always current. Um, uh, what has been fulfilling about being on the government side and on the non-governmental side and what has been a challenge? Yeah, so it's, it's funny when I go into DC these days and I you know go by the White House, it feels, like so long ago in some ways. Um, and I obviously miss it in the sense that whether it was, you know, Foggy Bottom and working at the State Department or walking into the East Wing and the hallowed halls of the White House, there is a impact that you have that is um, tough to compete with in any other sector, right? When you're in the federal government, there is a scale of impact that you have because of just the, the way policy and budgets operate. Um, you know, so Professor Duke mentioned that I led Let Girls Learn. Um, Let Girls Learn, that was a billion dollar government initiative where we were able to garner a billion dollars of private commitments. You frankly get spoiled mm -hmm. when you're in the White House because you pick up the phone and everyone responds to your call. And I remember, you know, kind of leaving and people said like, you're gonna, you're gonna miss that because obviously um, there is a platform 
that you have in the White House that allows you to convene, um, to uh, amplify an issue. Um, and that was really important when I served as Michelle Obama's policy director. Her ask of me was find issues that have obvious national importance that don't receive the attention that they deserve. And let's figure out a way, you know, even through the East Wing, I mean, bear in mind, Michelle Obama was not a US government employee. There was no kind of automatic reporting lines of federal agencies. And so part of our power, it wasn't, you know, Congress's power of the purse. It wasn't the president's power of, you know, leading the administration. It was sort of the power of persuasion. It was the power of partnerships. And that was just a wonderful experience to understand um, in, at the highest level, the value of public-private partnerships. Um, that said, I have loved uh, my work today in the nonprofit uh, sector because part of it is, you know, you don't go through the, the bureaucracy, the clearance process. Every time you want to say something, you know, you want to speak truth to power, you just say it. The worst thing that can happen, and not to kind of um, minimize this, is, you know, your board chair says, mm, you know, do you really want to bite the hand that feeds you because we are largely federally funded. But for us as a nonprofit organization, it's really important to speak truth to power for us to kind of explain where um, there are opportunities and where we are falling short. And I have loved the ability, you know, Dean Moore, I know you mentioned celebrating your 40th anniversary. So we a couple years ago celebrated our 80th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And I am told that I hide our 83 year old age well. I hope that's the case. I appreciated <laughs> uh, Professor Duke not saying, um, oh, well, that explains, uh, you know, the, the bags under her eyes and rather saying she has her plate full. But, um, you know, it is such an exciting time for organizations like ours because in so many ways we are reinventing ourselves. We are trying to navigate new dynamics. And so for me, that's a really exciting opportunity for LIRS because I came in wanting to shift LIRS from just being a government contractor right. to also being a nonprofit and also being a social enterprise. And kind of the bottom line point of that is when you know that there are risks because the immigration space is so politicized, and so rather than experiencing this political roller coaster ride where every time a new administration comes in that is supportive of immigration, our programming goes up. Every time an administration that kind of fear mongers and is anti-immigration, our programming declines. Our point is that there are ways in which we can be creative in how we resource our programs. And so that's how we've pursued things like um, employment uh, programming, knowing that so many companies are desperately looking for hiring our clients. Or, you know, this year we're launching a CDFI, a community development finance institution that will serve um, kind of lower income populations here in Maryland. And the idea is to diversify our revenue. So it's a, a really exciting opportunity. Um, I joke that I'm the head of an 83 year old startup. Um, you know, it, it, uh, it, it keeps it exciting. Well, I'll tell you, um, the 83-year-old organizations can be a startup, and so can 40-year-old schools. So uh, we we share something there, too. I'm very excited to hear that you're launching a community development finance uh, institution because that is there is such a need in that area. Uh, you said it's going to be here in Maryland. Do you know yet where it'll be based and and what uh, what population and what model you're going to use for that? Yeah, great question. Appreciate it. So it will be headquartered in Baltimore, um, but um, you know, and we're literally kind of drafting the Articles of Incorporation. We just sort of received board approval. Um, but the idea would be that it would cover census tracts, including kind of the greater Baltimore area. Um, longer term, our hope is to potentially expand uh, beyond Maryland. Um, there's obviously a significant immigrant population in Northern Virginia. Um, and our idea is to really focus on new Americans. Um, we know that a third of immigrants don't have a bank account. This is obviously an underbanked population. Um, and we have some experience because we manage the travel loans that refugees receive 
when they're traveling here to the US. Sometimes people don't appreciate that this is actually a loan that's given to them that they have to repay. And you know, we're of course not loan sharks, but the theory is let's help them build a credit score as soon as we can. And so our hope has actually been um, somewhat inspired. Uh, you know, my husband's family is all military. Um, and so, you know, we get our insurance through USAA. And just as USAA serves military families, our thought is, could we create an institution that would serve um, immigrant clients, knowing that they are sometimes overlooked? So no Talia students, uh, this is a very vibrant space. You can, you know, go create a new financial institution that would directly serve people um, uh, I'm not, I'm not, uh, recruiting for you yet, Krish, but, uh, I'm, I'm going to purge on it. <laughs> you know, this, this is a very dynamic space. The needs are huge, but I think building a new business model for serving those immigrant needs, um, is just a huge need and is something that our students should have the skill sets to really help with. I just wanted to ask one last question before turning it over to our students. And it's my constant conundrum about why the status of dreamers doesn't get sorted out. It's the one piece of the immigration uh, agenda that uh, there really is broader agreement or at least broad enough agreement to get something done but it keeps not getting done. Can, can you unpack that a little bit? What, where is the policy failure that leads us to constantly not get dreamers taken care of? Any yeah. insights? Um, I will do my best to explain. I'm not sure if it'll be insightful. Um, so you'll have to be the judge of that. It's a great question because obviously in the DMV area, um, you know, we are home to roughly 18,000 um, DACA recipients, um, you know, you, you Dean, uh, probably know it better than anyone, which is that our communities, our academic institutions are enriched by dreamers. And the labor market, um, our economy um, is obviously greatly uh, benefited by the contributions of dreamers. Um, I would also include that in that uh, temporary protected status holders, mm -hmm. um, yeah. essential workers, farm workers, uh, you know, there's a, there was a nationwide survey um, that found that after receiving DACA, uh, recipients moved to jobs with better pay, um, they gained greater access to employment that better matched their education and training, um, and they were able to access better working conditions. And so we obviously know that the uncertainty of status creates this limbo um, that undermines um, you know, dreamers' um, ability to contribute um, their well-being. So in terms of legislative efforts, um, you know, obviously uh, we have achieved some uh, victories at the local level in terms of access to higher education, um, certain benefits um, in, you know, there's three jurisdictions where dreamers can access in-state tuition, but obviously we are not anywhere close to where we need to be. Um, and that's where, you know, a permanent solution can only be achieved through congressional action. Um, so this is where, you know, I've been so inspired by the dreamers who have been on the front lines of this issue. Um, on the very first day, uh, President Biden signed an executive order to preserve DACA um, and, and propose an immigration bill. Um, it is unfortunate that, you know, we still haven't seen real uh, movement. Um, we were encouraged uh, last March when the, you know, there was a Dream and Promise Act um, that passed the House with more bipartisan support than ever. Um, but just last month, you know, we saw renewed commitments on permanent solutions during the State of the Union. Uh, but candidly, I hate to say this, but I'm not sure that I am holding my breath. Um, I think it is a great line, but I don't know that members of Congress um, are doing more than, you know, inviting dreamers to events and, you know, some of the kind of the optics. Um, and that's where it's just troubling because we have nearly 80% of voters who support a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants. Um, we know there is public support for policy solutions that keep families together, that help grow our economy. 
And, and so this is where I, I just, I think um, I would stress to your students, we have to continue to push this issue. We have to tell our political leaders that it isn't just about a press release or a public announcement. We've got to deliver results. Um, and so I think that, you know, hopefully there are some opportunities, but we can't sit silent and we can't be passive about the issue. Great. Uh, I, I said that was my last question, but I, I can't uh, avoid one, one last, last question, and that is uh, the role for universities and schools like ours. Uh, clearly, we do scholarship on these issues, so we publish, uh, we teach courses on immigration policy and the like. Um, the University of Maryland is hosting a number of Afghan families um, and supporting them. What else can we aspire to do as, a, as an academic community, as a, um, uh, a large enterprise that is a, a very large research university? Um, can you give us a, a, our marching orders? What else should we be doing in this space? Yeah, well, and I've been so grateful to see the leadership um, on, a, on a range of issues. I think sometimes you see academic institutions are wary to take on issues that are viewed as a lightning rod, and I have certainly not seen that. Um, uh, and I just want to say kudos uh, for your leadership um, in terms of not shirking away um, from what are potentially divisive issues, but to me, it's just about how you frame it, right? And so I think that there's um, four things that I would say you could do um, more of. You're doing, I think, a significant amount of it, but I think it is always beneficial. So one is just framing the problem, right? Explaining um, in concrete data, the kind of data that, you know, my teams have the difficulty because we're pulled in umpteen different directions and so much of our jobs feel like putting out fires sometimes, um, that it is really helpful to do that detailed analysis. Um, I have, you know, I remember in uh, college when I was getting my master's, um, status data was mm -hmm. like the bane of my existence. <laughs> and it's fortunately, the bane of other I, people's existence today. <laughs> but I know that there are students on this call who like are just so nimble with this kind of, you know, quantitative analysis that it would be welcome to use your talents to really distill the data, when I talk about kind of um, distinguishing fact from fiction, like this is where I think academic institutions can do those deep dives. Um, second, it's about uh, the solutions. You know, I was um, sending a message to some White House colleagues this morning, and I was just joking because one had said to me, oh, you know, I saw you on, on MSNBC, but the audio was off. And I joked about how, oh, that was unfortunate because I was telling you how to do your job. And what I mean by that is, look, you know, again, you have the analytics, you have the kind of um, uh, ability to take a step back and say, this is actually, you know, a better system. Um, and in the immigration space, let's just be honest about it. This, you know, the U.S. immigration system has been uh, dysfunctional in ways um, for years, right? This is no one administration. Um, and I think that that's where, you know, we certainly look to academic papers in terms of clear recommendations of, of a path forward. Um, I think third, you know, so, so that's kind of the policy pieces, right? But when we're talking to political leaders and we're trying to bring about real change, it's about acknowledging that the politics are complicated. And so any data that shows whether an issue is politically supported or not is valuable because we can then take that to the political leaders. We don't have a extensive, you know, lobbying shop on K Street. We don't have a budget for um, this kind of work. But to the extent that you're doing surveys and that sort of thing that we can point to, it really makes it easier for our political leaders to do the right thing. And then just the, the final piece is empowering students um, to be practitioners. Uh, you know, we are headquartered in Baltimore. We have offices in Hyattsville, Frederick, um, Catonsville, a couple offices in Northern Virginia. We are in 38 states across the country. So whether you are going home for the summer or you are here during the school year, 
we are always desperate for talent. And so, you know, I think empowering students to really get that experience, frankly, get a foot in the door. For me, that was the invaluable experience that I had as a student, not to take in any way from my academic experiences, like that's how I made decisions on kind of what to pursue was, you know, using those experiences of being there for a couple months, um, you know, over the summers or interning during a semester. Well, Washington DC is metroable, but Hyattsville is walkable. So maybe your office in Hyattsville is the, uh, <laughs> is the golden one here. Okay, with that, I would like to introduce Patrick Kelly, a second year master's student uh, and our Brody scholar who will be uh, leading our students through their conversation with Krish. But Krish, I just wanna thank you so much for joining us today. And you are now in the true boss's hands. Patrick, all yours. Thank you, Dinor. Thank you, Dinor. Um, you know, that's, it's been a fantastic conversation so far. I have a bunch of notes. Just hopefully we can get back to them at some point because so many things kind of inspired some thought in me. But um, I wanted to thank you again, Chris, for coming to speak with us today. It's been fantastic. And um, I know a lot of students are here to hear what you have to say. You have so much insight and so much experience that can impart on them and help them in their future careers. Um, so we do have some questions ready for you. And yeah, if you don't mind, we can jump right in. Great, awesome. thank you, Patrick. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our first one, um, it's a little bit more vague, but kind of touching on more how we can make immigration policy a little bit more interdisciplinary and how mm, the students in various fields can do their part if they can. Um, so what do you think are some policy areas in need of most improvement concerning immigrants and refugees? So kind of touching on like maybe housing policy, health policy, education. We have a lot of specializations at SPP. So I'm sure students would like to know how and uh, where and how they can help. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. And I am um, just a strong proponent of analyzing these issues with the intersectionality that is the reality of how these affect our clients um, and, and how immigration intersects with the range of issues. So, you know, I think I would say um, kind of broader level, there are clear connections between immigration and economics. Um, so take, for example, we have, uh, you know, an inverted pyramid, when you look at the fact that we have um, aging Americans um, and uh, the lowest birth rate since the census began, right? And so when we think about how will this issue of immigration affect all of us candidly, whether you care about this because you're an immigrant or your parents were, you know, immigrants or, um, you know, you are, uh, annoyed because your um, coffee shop is, is closed uh, because there are a lack of, of, of workers. Um, I think it's really important to understand that, you know, Medicare, Social Security, they risk going bankrupt if we don't figure out how do we shift the inverted pyramid um, and, and change those dynamics. We look at Japan. Um, where, you know, candidly, the economy is more stagnant than it ought to be because it has an aging population. Um, you know, there was this interesting data point I saw that has stuck with me. There are more diapers from older Japanese than there are from babies. And that is, uh, you know, I hope no one thinks that I have a potty mouth, but like that's an issue. Um, here in the U.S., we've got to acknowledge that, you know, when um, we have a lower percentage of an immigrant population today than we had in 1920. And so when there are these ideas of, oh, well, the country's full or we can't take in any more immigrants, it's baseless. Like there's actually no rationale for that. So I think it's really important to approach immigration from an economic perspective. Um, I think likewise, you know, housing. Um, there is obviously an affordable housing crisis that we as Americans have experienced. 
And particularly in this region of the DMV, we're seeing it. So imagine you're an immigrant who comes to the US, you have no nest egg, you have no guaranteed income yet because you haven't landed a job. And uh, you know a lot of landlords have no idea what a refugee is or an asylum seeker. It's, it's just difficult to understand. And, and that's where we have a role to play to really figure out the affordable housing crisis, um, how that affect, affects vulnerable populations, whether they are immigrants or otherwise. And then the final area I think I'd note is mental health. Um, so as Americans, we have obviously, I think, talked more about mental health in recent times than we have historically. And I think that that is a welcome development that we don't view this as taboo. So when you think about you know, family separation, um, this was a crisis in 2018 where LIRS was one of two organizations that the government turned to to reunify kids with their parents. The trauma that these kids, that these parents experienced is an area where having more social workers, having more clinicians. Uh, we launched a mental health program for unaccompanied kids at the end of last year um, because we know that children and their sponsors, meaning their parent or guardian, are experiencing trauma as a result of what happened in their home country, trauma from the treacherous journey so many of them took to come to the US, and then the trauma of not knowing what comes next. And so I think just really um, uh, finding more social workers, it is incredibly difficult for us to hire um, people who come from this background, I think is, is, a, is a key part of addressing um, the immigration crisis that we're facing. No, I think that's, that's really innovative thinking. And I think because I'm seeing the same kind of talk in some of the areas that I'm studying in. I mentioned to you earlier that I'm at the start program studying terrorism analysis, my capstones on human trafficking. Um, and we're seeing public health approaches coming into those spaces for that more holistic, more mental health oriented and trauma focused um, practices. Um, are you seeing any, any headway in that kind of space in immigration policy? Maybe some more, um, some more of those holistic practices and bring in those things. Yeah, so, you know, I know there was a question earlier about um, the experiences of working in the administration versus working in the nonprofit sector. And what I have loved about the experience of serving as a CEO of LIRS is, you know, you can build it, right? And the theory is if you build it, they will come. Um, so when we saw that there was a clear need for trauma-informed care, we know that the government isn't necessarily going to be an early adopter. I think it's fair to say that oftentimes they are a late adopter. Um, so our approach has been, we will build these pilots, we'll look to the private sector, um, donors, foundations, companies, in order to show the value, the need, and the success of these pilot projects in the hopes that we can ultimately pitch it. To the government. Um, you know, we are in the early stages of this mental health program, uh, but we have expanded, you know, for example, our therapeutic foster care. So this is a program that serves unaccompanied kids where, um, you know, an unaccompanied kid will, a child will come across the southern border. Um, our region actually has a significant uh, percentage of unaccompanied kids who come because there are so many sponsors who live in the area. And uh, what we do is we work with the sponsors to, you know, go through the vetting, make sure that, you know, this isn't a case of human trafficking to kind of your background. Um, and then we reunify the kid with the sponsor. And in that interim time period, we're, when we're doing the background checks and walk, working with the sponsors, we want the kids to begin the healing process. So we launched a therapeutic foster care program with Kennedy Krieger so we could begin to provide that kind of care even before we reunify them um, with their parent or guardian. And I think that that's um, an example of where the administration didn't say to us, hey, that's a need, we need more capacity. We said to them, look, you're putting kids in more secure facilities, basically kind of putting them in lockdown when that is not the answer. It's addressing the root cause, which is trauma. 
And it's funny that you mentioned that about where the government is at with that, because my capstone is working with JTIF in the State Department and helping them define trauma-informed, survivor-informed, and victim-informed approaches. Um, but yeah, I think we need to talk after this. Yes, absolutely. Because uh, I'm looking at their international programming, and it's exactly all the stuff that you're talking about. And there's a lot of amazing NGOs out there. Um, so to make sure we get to more of the questions, we have a lot of, there's a lot of really monumental things happening in the immigration space. So we have a few questions oriented around that. So um, the first one we have is, uh, what are some lessons that we can learn from the Afghanistan withdrawal and refugee crisis? I know, a very easy question, right? Yeah, um, so it's it's a great question because we lived this day to day around this time last year. Um, so we had been, you know, privately communicating with the administration when we knew that the U.S. was going to withdraw from Afghanistan, but it didn't seem like there was a clear plan in place for the Afghan special immigrant visas um, applicants who basically they served as interpreters or translators alongside our US military or at our US embassy. Um, they may have been a gender rights activist or a journalist. Um, and what ended up happening was we said, look, you can't wait until August, right? Until the withdrawal date to evacuate our allies. You need to have a system in place that allows for this to be far more orderly. And the problem was that the system had been broken. So when the Biden administration came into power, they had inherited a 17,000 backlog of applicants. By law, the US is required to process special immigrant visas in nine months. It was taking on average three years. And so we knew that we needed to do something dramatic in order to keep our promise to our allies. And unfortunately, our um, you know, requests and then ultimately demands were not heeded um, and we saw what happened in August. And so I think some of this is getting ahead of these crises. Um, you know, even in Ukraine, we obviously knew that there were rumblings of a potential uh, Putin invasion. We knew that citizens were not just going to be the bribe product, but the potential target of attacks. And so, you know, it's unfortunate when you think about the fact that we're about five weeks after the invasion began and the U.S. still has no real system in place to protect 100,000 Ukrainian refugees as the president announced. And so I think that's where, you know, right now it feels like um, political leaders have a, a reactive mode of uh, you know, waiting until there's a fire to put it out. And our approach is look, you know, I know immigration may feel like an issue where you don't wanna be proactive, but these issues don't go away. And a proactive strategy is far better than a reactive one. So weeks ago, we were saying to the administration, look, we need to use every single pathway to help Ukrainians knowing that countries like Poland had have received 2.2 million. And we are heartened that 100,000 will come to the US, but we know that humanitarian crises will not go away. Whether it is hurricanes hitting Central America um, and the climate disaster, where we would expect up to 200 million who will be displaced by 2050. And so when we think about the proportion of people who are being affected, I hate to say that this will be the norm, um, you know, that this will be kind of the rule rather than the exception, but I do think recent events have shown that we need to have more holistic strategies rather than kind of a patchwork or band-aid response. No, that makes complete sense. Um, I mean, my initial thought is, um, I'm not sure if this would go down well, but I mean, just stratifying by vulnerable populations concerning the um, target states and demographics and the topics in the area, like you said, gender activists in Afghanistan, um, kind of making those maybe a more higher priority. Um, so 
maybe detracting a little bit from the current topic, but to get some more of these questions, uh, Miranda writes that you mentioned the power of persuasion earlier, which is an inspirational call uh, to action for students who are investing in issues that don't always get the attention they deserve. So uh, what career advice do you have for those of us that uh, want to magnify overlooked policy problems? Yeah, it's a great question, Miranda, because honestly, this has been an evolution in my career. When I was at the State Department, our communication strategy was we would put out a press release and you know our job would be done. We thought it's out there in the ether. Whether no one reads it was not our concern. And when I went to the White House, Michelle taught me this really important lesson of we've got to meet people where they are. Just because you put out a press release doesn't mean that anyone will read it. And so we were incredibly creative in terms of doing carpool karaoke or going on late night or speaking to Hollywood writers to write in to Gilmore Girls. Um, you know, a point about girls' education and how there are millions of girls today who are not completing their educations. And so I think that um, being creative, you know, kind of willing to try different things, experiment, um, is really valuable for political leaders. I also think it's critical um, to just uh, realize that we've got to meet people where they are. And so that is going to be on social media. That may be on, you know, TikTok or or whatever sort of the latest is. Um, and I think that's a really important part of what policymakers sometimes don't do. We sort of defer the press, the communications to others, thinking that it is not as important as policy. And I have certainly learned uh, from my career that we do a good job on policy, we do a terrible job on the PR, the communications. And that's where I think that anyone who has the opportunity to get um, some experience in that area under your belt, it's very valuable because whatever career you pursue, I almost guarantee you, you'll find value in it. I think that goes really well with hand in hand with what you were talking about with uh, Dean or just having all of those statistics and all of the um, pragmatic approaches behind you, but still not forgetting this other approach. And that's something that I'm sure we can all be reminded of in our program. We do tend to get bogged down uh, in the weeds and in the technical side, but it's just as important. Um, okay, so yes, uh, next question. Uh, you have worked on a variety of policy topics while in the State Department and Michelle Obama's office. Do you think there are significant trade-offs to specializing in like one policy area versus being more jack of all trades and diversifying your experience? So there, there are trade-offs, um, uh, but I think it's really important to stress that doing one or the other or both will never really hold you back, um, depending on kind of how you view, view that time period. So, you know, I have spent a couple of years working as a lawyer, um, several years in the administration, uh, ran for political office, um, run a nonprofit. And each of those experiences has been invaluable because feel like I know enough law to be dangerous. So when lawyers say something to me, I can push back because I have a baseline of knowledge. Or, you know, when I see a spreadsheet, um, you know, whether it's because of my science uh, background or spending a little bit of time in management consulting, um, I have a comfort um, in that area. So I think it really is, how are you wired? Like I am someone who um, I love connecting the dots. Um, I think I would get bored if I spent a career working on one specific issue. And so I think that I view my value add as being able to draw from different experiences in order to 
have a more diversified approach. Um, that said, you know, it just depends on kind of what you ultimately want to do. If I'm having surgery at shock trauma, right? I want a doctor who has done that procedure a thousand times. I don't want them to have kind of dabbled in different areas. But if I'm talking about a hospital administrator or a public health official who is leading the nation's COVID response, it would be useful if it was someone who had some business background, who had some science experience, who had some uh, practitioner experience of being a doctor and seeing patients who, you know, maybe has some business sense. Um, and so I think that's where, to the extent that you know, it's valuable to kind of know where you want to go and then work backwards. It's also okay to say, I don't know what I want to do. But the virtue of our careers today is that hopefully, probably, you will have a couple or a few careers. And so I think that's where, you know, I, I know this sounds cliche, but like following your passions is really important. I know when you kind of look at my resume, it may feel like it somehow made sense. I don't think so. But that was a decade of trial and error. And I wouldn't take back a day of what I did. I, yeah, that's fantastic advice, I'm sure, for all of us on the call, all of us in school. Um, helps to reassure any of our worries about what we should be doing, as long as we make the most of whatever it is that we are doing. Um, well, and just so, on that point, like here's a good example. You know, my, yeah. my husband uh, is the president and CEO of the National Wildlife Federation. And I think sometimes people leave conversations with us with their heads spinning because if they asked us, should I go to law school? My husband was half away across the country driving to Stanford Law when he was in Applebee's and he was like, I don't wanna be a lawyer. Why am I going to law school? And I you know, went to law school knowing I didn't wanna be a lawyer. And obviously, you know, we both ended up leading national nonprofits. And so that's kind of my point of like, relax. I know it's tough to sometimes take a step back and realize that there is no bad decision, but if, if we are an example of anything, it's that you can get to the same endpoint, right? Through different paths. Yeah, I think it's a, <clears throat> excuse me, that's a perfect way to um, put that. Um, so I believe we have time for one more question. And uh, this one's going to read, uh, what can policymakers and bureaucrats do to uplift and validate the voices of grassroots activists who champion disenfranchised communities or under-recognized uh, public policy issues? Yeah, it's a great question and one that is wonderful to end on because I do think political leaders sometimes view it as a vulnerability to acknowledge what they know and what they don't know. And the truth is that from every perspective, there is a value that you bring. Um, unfortunately, and all too often, there are not the diversity of opinions and experiences that we need at the table. Um, you know, I am uh, the only woman who runs uh, any of the nine resettlement agencies. The majority of us have a, uh, you know, staff that is majority women. So like, why is that the case, right? Like, how are we still in 2022 in a place where I am one of nine? Um, when I ran for office in Maryland, um, I was one of nine candidates um, where I was the only woman uh, for the bulk of the race. And I just think that this is where uh, we need to lean on um, that diversity of experience where you can't do it all, you can't know it all. And so empowering grassroots leaders um, allowing them to be the voice for some of these causes is critically important. Um, looking to them as the experts, um, consulting them, empowering them to make decisions, I think is very valuable. Well, thank you. I, I think it uh, falls to me to bring us to a close here, but Krish, I want to thank you for a 
very in-depth uh, exploration of not just this field, but where our students could see themselves in this field. And Patrick, thank you for taking a lead on, uh, on bringing your colleagues into the conversation. Um, something stuck with me from early in your talk, Chris, you talked about you worked in the first lady's office. And of course we had to use the power of persuasion and partnerships. Um, and not the kind of bureaucratic or, or financial levers. It, it strikes me that you are perfectly well adapted to the world of persuasion and partnerships, <laughs> which is, I believe, key to leadership in the public sphere. Um, and, and I think the, those technical things that Patrick referred to, those technical skills we give students and I hope they will flood you with data and analysis so that you can use those. Um, but I hope that everyone will have uh, watched this leader today in action um, in her passion for the issues she talks about, not just the analytics. And uh, I think the art of persuasion was very well used today. You certainly persuaded me that uh, what got me into this field is still a, uh, big need in 2022. And uh, I'll, I'll rally to your flag anytime, Krish. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, um, Dean Orr, Patrick, for such a great conversation. Really appreciate it.